welcome to the stage, Bill Tolliver. Thank you very much. Social media, just like all media, is going through an evolution. In a lot of ways, it's more oriented towards stimulation rather than information. It's more oriented towards a transaction rather than getting people to think deeply about something. It's more oriented towards the impulse. We have to ask ourselves a bigger question. What would Nelson Mandela have done with the internet? What would Martin Luther King have done with just a smartphone? What would Gandhi have done with something as simple as a Facebook page? And what's amazing to me is even though we have all this technology, guess what? We still are trying to create what Nelson Mandela created. We're still struggling to find a way to mobilize people the way Gandhi did, the way King did. Think about that. The real question isn't, what would Gandhi have done with Facebook? What would Mandela have done with the internet? The question to us is, using those examples, what could we do with them? There's one organization out there, there are many, but there's one in particular called Peace One Day. Didn't even exist just a few years ago. Mastering the use of many different types of medium, including social media, to create an incredible movement. To do what? To just have a day each year where there's peace. Let's look at a little video of their work. My name's Jeremy Gilley. I'm an independent documentary filmmaker. In July 1998, confused and frightened by what was going on in the world, I decided to make a film about peace. Then I realized there was no day of peace. That was it. I was going to try and establish an annual day of ceasefire and non-violence, a peace day with a fixed calendar date. So I traveled the world to build and document a case for the day's existence. The day could be the beginning of a deeper process. It has the practical uh, impact of allowing access of humanitarian aid, access of information, uh, freedom of movement, uh, relief from the pressure and tension of not knowing where the next bomb or bullet may come from. If you have one day of peace all over the world, I think that would be, that would be great. Uh, and it's, worth, it's, it's a worthwhile cause to work for. Any moment, whether it's a day or a week, that we can give the combatants to pause, to reflect on what they are doing to their people and the environment will be a great achievement. And I will support it 100%. The United Kingdom and Costa Rican governments have now joined together. I think it's to very, very important and I love what we're trying for. The need for such an enhanced approach was originally brought to our attention by a UK-based non-governmental organization, Peace One Day. This is a step forward in international relations. Be observed as a global ceasefire day. Let's stand up on September 21st and let's begin. May I take it that the assembly decides to adopt that resolution? It is so decided. things that you have in court that you whack, they whack one of them. A peace day has been adopted by every member state of the United Nations. An annual day separate from politics and religion. A day when every human being on earth can become involved in the peace process. A day of global unity. A day when lives are saved. The message is spreading. Over a hundred million people in over a hundred countries are marking the day today in many different ways. It's up to our generation to build the foundation for a united world. And it'll grow, it'll really grow if you get behind it. So please mark Peace Day, 21st of September, and lives will be saved. One individual may be small, but United and combined all six billion people, that will make a great difference. If you build a house, 
you start with one brick. If we want to build peace, why not start with one day? And that day has arrived. Jeremy Gilley's crazy. He's insane. He actually believes that he not only has the ability to mobilize the entire world to create peace, but he actually has the obligation to do it. A single man. He is one of the busiest people I've ever met in my life, and he's agreed to spend the day with us to talk about his work with Peace One Day. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jeremy Gilley. Thank you very much. Um, well, listen, it's a great honor to uh, be here, and I'd obviously like to thank uh, immediately IFC for asking me to be with you and sort of share this story. And in sort of 20 minutes, I'm going to just sort of tell you about the last sort of 12, 13 years. But as you know from that film, I, I was just frightened and confused and not really understanding what was going on in the home, what was going on in the community, and what was going on in the wider world. I mean, I couldn't understand the violence, the destruction. Should I have children? Is that a responsible thing to do? Is humankind fundamentally evil? Is the destruction of the world inevitable? I mean, I was just spinning out with those kinds of thoughts and wanting to do something, but having no skills. I, I don't have any qualifications. Actually, I do. I have a D in pottery. But I left, school, I left school young. I was told I was dyslexic. I was bottom of the class. I was humiliated there. You know, all of those sorts of things. And I was really just trying to make sense of everything. And the only skills that I had were those of a filmmaker. And that's when I had the idea. I thought, okay, that's it. I'm going to try and I'm going to make a film about creating a day of peace, a day of ceasefire and nonviolence with a fixed calendar date voted by every member state of the United Nations. And I didn't even really know what the United Nations was. <laughs> but I knew that if I tried to do that and I failed, as I was bound to fail, because I'm angry about what was going on, at least I'd have a structure, there'd be a profound statement about how unwilling we are to come together. And I knew, I knew as a filmmaker, I knew that was it. There was the journey, there was the climb, there was the structure, and I just began that journey. We had nothing, absolutely nothing. I mean, I, um, you know, the suit's nice, but it was bought for me. I mean, you know, things are different now, and I do get paid. But, it, but then, we literally had nothing, and we were playing guitars and busking and doing nights of poetry. And, you know, I, I remember we launched the campaign. I invited the world's media. 114 people turned up. They were mostly my friends. You know, it wasn't interesting to people, particularly that the first ever day of ceasefire and nonviolence was, go was going to try to be, you know, created. And we began that journey. So that was sort of chapter one, chapter one. And I see this in chapters, and I'm going to talk to you in a second about the third and final chapter. But the first chapter was establishing this day, and I'm pleased that after many years of travel in the world, it was established, and I put that film out, and I could hear the cynics saying, yeah, it's just a day, it's just symbolism, it's not gonna, nobody's going to stop fighting. You know, and I was like, oh my God, I was ever so shocked and frightened that you know, I'd been around the world with most incredible people and nobody was believing it, and so we said, okay, let's make another film, let's keep going, let's go to the one place that everybody says it's going to be impossible, that's Afghanistan, let's see if the Taliban could be involved in this process, let's see if we could stop it in Afghanistan, and if we could stop it, then UNICEF and WHO will be able to take thousands of vaccinators into areas that you couldn't normally go and vaccinate millions of children. And after speaking with everybody, everybody, doctors, uh, teachers, uh, nurses, uh, civil society, ISAF, NATO, uh, Karzai, I mean, you, uh, you, UNAMA, UNICEF, WHO, Fatima Galani, you name it, we spoke to them. And it really got momentum. And I saw this letter from the head of the Mahajadeen saying, OK, no humanitarian workers will be harmed or kidnapped, and we will observe this day. And then everybody observed the day. And it all was very successful. And UNICEF and WHO took 10,000 vaccinators into areas you couldn't normally go, and they vaccinated 1.4 million children as a consequence of that day. It was remarkable. <clears throat> the final chapter is that we need to institutionalize that day. And I've been working with McKinsey recently. I didn't know who McKinsey were a few months ago. And the information I'm going to show you, I had no idea about this kind of information, but I'm now fascinated by it. And I'm as hungry to get a result as I was 13 years ago, if not more so. I am fascinated by the way in which this case study is unfolding to give as a vessel to new generation, you know, to kind of go, OK, well, he got that bit wrong, or he got that bit right, or, you know,
know, and great if there was something wrong. Failing, jumping out, you know, being, being cool with the no is what it's all about for me, because that's where it becomes very interesting, I think. So McKinsey is saying, at the present pace of which this is going, three billion people will be aware of Peace Day by 2016. Well, that's an amazing figure. They're calling it. I'm amazed and excited, and we're all a part of that. Of course, it's everybody's legacy. And the properties that we use, and this is all sort of just on, this is just developed, and it, and it sort of grew in this way. The things that we do is dance, because, of course, loads of people want to engage in that way. It doesn't cost anything. They're doing it in schools and in youth clubs and all kinds of environments. We've utilized art very recently just to raise the most amount of money that we've ever raised in the night, 420,000 pounds, through art, turning AK-4. 47s into objects of peace by the greatest artists from the United Kingdom. It was phenomenally successful and generated a lot of buzz. Obviously, we're working as hard as we can within social media. We're spending just over about a million pounds, actually. So our budget is incredibly tiny on an annual basis. And you'll know because, you know, I mean, we've got, I don't know, 20 people in the office. And some of these organizations will have, you know, many people more than that, just fundraising itself. So it gives you a sense of what's going on. But we're cool with that. It means we can move quickly and we don't have to, you know, get lots of yeses from lots of different people. We make a decision and we have a crack. The social media is interesting. The, this global truce, the reason why global truce exists is that in Afghanistan in 2008, so the following year, the UN, after we'd done it that first time, the UN's Department of Security and Safety came out with a statement saying that violence was down in Afghanistan by 70% on the day, on the day of peace, that violence was down by 70%. And that amazed me. I was like, wow. And I kept thinking about it for months, like 70%, violence down by 70%, wow. What if, therefore, we could create a day where we reduce violence on a global scale? I mean, if you can do it in Afghanistan, and that was the place that everybody said it was impossible, surely we could do it globally, because, well, we, we, we surely could. I mean, it makes total sense that we could. And that's what Global Truce is, was to say, OK, this year, just gone, we will try to reduce violence globally and measure it by, by activating the most amount of people that have ever stood together in the name of peace. And that's what Global Truce is. And McKinsey are becoming fundamentally important to it about setting the marker of exactly where we were only weeks ago. The life-saving initiatives I've told you about, many of your organizations were involved. Global Truce, as part of that initiative to reduce violence on a day, we built coalitions, an NGO coalition, over 400 NGOs active on the day. So that's the life-saving side of things. The education, Traveling the world, from the beginning, I was always in schools. And we now have a global education resource, I'm delighted to say, is funded by Skype. It's in the six official languages of the United Nations. We've seen registration in 197 countries. And when I sit with various people, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court of Justice or whoever, and say, when is this place going to shut? And he says, when we give peace education you know, to every young person on the planet, when we give them the tools to become the peacemakers, to let them know that they can make a difference and that they can change the world and that their actions count. The way we funded it is with corporations, because I was running around trying to get a little bit, I mean, it just wasn't working. And I, it was when I started to go to the corporate sector and say, listen, will you invest in this process? We will give you our values. You can, uh, and effectively, you can, you can communicate that message out. You can engage your workforce, engage your product, and we create a bespoke opportunity together. But if you tell us what to do and how to do it, then there's no relationship. And this has been very, very interesting and very successful for us. You can see all of these things start to uh, generate buzz. And ultimately, that's what it's all about. If you've got to go back to the beginning slide that we talked about, it's about the institutionalization of this day. And all we've got to do is we've got to make sure that a person knows, the individual knows, that when they click, they are changing the world. The individuals of this planet must know that they can make a difference, that it's in the hands of us and not governments. In order to do that, you've got to measure it. I can't just stand up here and go, hey, it's great, and we're doing really well, and it's all, it, we're all doing it. We've got to really measure it in a very precise way. And I was delighted to be with the CEO, Dominic Barton of McKinsey, who then put his teams on it, who are now in our office at, you know, at no cost, which is obviously incredible. And so we're measuring. And these are some of the slides that they've shown me. And, and, and these, are, these are amazing slides to me and very, very interesting because it's changing the way I, we are investing in the choices that we're making in order to get to that institutionalization and the 3 billion people by 2016.
And this slide, you know, this, this one I really love. This is the one that I'm thinking about on a daily basis and getting ever so excited about. This is the methodology of measurement. This, this is ev absolutely everything for us as we go on this final phase. And it's also the most important thing to the individual, to the person at home who believes that peace is in the hands of the government. It's not. We know that. But in order to prove that, it's one thing to show a film and show that it worked in Afghanistan, but we have got to come up with a methodology of measurement that somebody can look at and go, right, I get it, I, t I really get it. And so therefore, what I'm saying and what I think, in the same way that Coca-Cola will show you a commercial to drink Coke, and some people will drink it or choose to drink it, what I'm saying is, and others are, is that if you have got a load of people involved in peace on one day, as a consequence of that, there must be a methodology of measurement that says, well, if they're thinking about peace, then they're not thinking about violence. And as a consequence of that, you must be able to measure a decrease. Now, there are many other things that are much more concrete than that, whether it's a ceasefire in Afghanistan or whatever. But that's what I'm really interested in. So measuring the participation on the day of peace, quantifying Quantifying the impact of that participation in relation to violence reduction, very interesting. Taking that information and looking what's effective in terms of how you're reducing and making sure that the investments that you make are in the right area so that this process can move along really quickly. As a consequence of that, refresh the, refresh the strategy by shifting the emphasis on what's getting the best return. And then we're creating standards and metrics for the future, which means that we can move the, the needle we will institutionalize this day of peace. You know, we will see a reduction of violence. We can measure that. And, and as a consequence of that, of course, we will have achieved our goal. And that's why I think the corporate sector is willing to take that logo and put it on the number one brand in the world because of these highly relevant driver discussion, positive reputation, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, look, I'm, I'm four minutes over what I should have done. I just want to thank you know, the IFC again for letting me tell this story. Thank you ever so much. You're the key to the door of peace. Raise, raise as much money as you can. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to highlight a few things that the people of Peace One Day are doing so that we can implant those ideas in our brains as we go through the next three days. The first thing that you see is that this organization understands that nothing ever changes in the world until some catalyst gets a critical mass of the right people to commit to that change. The other thing that they've done is they seized control of the model. If you think about the way most marketing is done, if you think about the way that the entire internet has been created, the basic models of advertising and everything else, they're built around a concept called segmentation. What is a segment? A segment is a bad thing. If you look at the dictionary definition, it's any of the parts into which something can be divided. It's a distinct subdivision of an organism or part. It is to divide or become divided. It is the central premise of all direct marketing. It's the central premise of all traditional models of advertising, and it is intended to divide, to get people into groupings that make some sense to somebody out in marketing land. Instead, the people of Peace One Day said, we're not trying to segment. We're trying to not worry about how we might profile people and, and offer the points of distinction. We're trying to build a community. We're trying to build a community not from a shared location, but from a shared value system. And more powerful than anything else is joint ownership or participation. People that are part of the Peace One Day community feel a sense of obligation and ownership for their work. They're not just passively clicking like. So many people are measuring things on how many likes have I gotten? How many click-throughs have I gotten? People like the people of Peace One Day, they understand that a like is only the first little sliver of interest, of indication of interest. And what they've done a brilliant job is capture those people and find a way to cultivate them and develop them and turn them in so that they're not just liking something, but they're joining something. And then they're taking action in favor of something. And then they're being advocates for something. That's profound. 
That's powerful. This is our time. This is time for us, as the internet and social media are going through all their external, existential manifestations and changes and angst, it's our chance to stand up, grab hold of it, and own it, and take it somewhere. It's time for us to lead. It's time for us to stand up together for the next three days and learn and be inspired and go out and do it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much.